Hello, Ottawa. How are we feeling? Okay, I'm going to ask for more. We are back in person in Ottawa after two years. And it is so nice to see all of your beautiful faces. Welcome to Concordia University Presents the Walrus Talks What's Next. My name is Jennifer Hollett, and I am the executive, executive director of the Walrus, and it just feels so great to be back live, IRL, in real life. Uh, we are really excited to be back at the National Gallery of Canada, but also streaming online at thewalrus.ca. So hello to over the, the over 300 people who are registered and tuning in from across the country and beyond. Yeah, so warm welcome to them. I'd like to start by acknowledging that we are gathered on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin people in Canada's capital city. And we're grateful to be in a place that has a rich history of storytelling, sharing, and conversation. A bit about the walrus. The walrus started 19 years ago really as an optimistic project. A project to tell the stories of Canadians and to foster conversation. And we do that in a number of different ways. We're best known for our journalism, which is available in print, but also online at thewalrus.ca as well for our podcasts. Our latest podcast is The Deep Dive, available wherever you get your podcasts, but also by bringing people together in public events like this one with the Walrus Talks. And no matter where the Walrus is or how people engage with us, we embrace our commitment to being independent, to sharing a diversity of perspectives, and to bringing together a community of curious people who care about the issues that matter most to us as Canadians. So thank you for joining us and for being a part of the Walrus. Now our work is made possible by the power of our donors, our supporters, and our partners. So a big thank you to Concordia University for making tonight's event possible. Concordia University has supported many iterations of the Walrus Talks across Canada over the years, and we're grateful for their support. I should note, I'm also a proud Concordia grad, so much so that when I graduated from the Journalism Communications Department in the late 90s, there was a Concordia campaign that ran on Toronto buses across the city, and my colleagues photoshopped my image on the campaign. I wasn't in the campaign, but <laughs> I was such a proud Concordia grab. They made sure I was a part of it. On that note, to tell us more about the great work that Concordia is doing, I am excited to welcome Concordia University's President, Vice Chancellor, and my friend, Graham Carr. Thanks, Jen, and uh, good evening, everybody. Boy, it is super great to see people here uh, uh, this evening. It's been a couple of years since we've been able to do this, uh, this in person. I have to say, uh, admit, that when I woke up this morning in Ottawa and saw it snowing, I thought maybe the answer to the question, what's next, is spring. Uh, I think we could all use it at this point. The other thing I'm secretly hoping uh, is that I can get through the evening without somebody saying, you're on mute, um, but we'll see how that goes. Um, I'm, I'm very pleased and thrilled to be here uh, uh, this evening on behalf of the university as part of our, our, our privileged relationship with the, uh, with the Walrus. But when I think about privilege, I also just want to take a moment to say that it's especially meaningful for us to have the opportunity to gather and do this this evening because as we know, in other parts of the world, uh, terrible things are happening. In fact, in our own neighborhoods, pretty terrible things are happening as well, and I think we need to be, be mindful of that and appreciate um, the opportunities that we have and be mindful about the things that we can do individually and collectively uh, to, tackle those, to tackle those problems. Being in this building is also uh, uh, poignant from a Concordia perspective. Some of you may know that the uh, the Deputy Director and Chief Curator of the National Gallery, Kitty Scott, is a, is a graduate of Concordia. And as you walked into uh, uh, the museum this evening, you may have noticed the photographs, which the, have been part of the, an, an outdoor ex exhibition at the gallery for a number of years. And those photographs are done by Geneviève Cadzu, who is a, a faculty member at Concordia. So I feel right at home being here. 
For those of you who don't know uh, Concordia, we're a large university in Montreal with more than 50,000 students. 25% 25, uh, 25 of our students are Francophone. Another 25% of our students speak a language other than English or French as their first language. And I really believe that that diversity is part of what makes Concordia an exciting, innovative, uh, innovative young university. In fact, a university that is has been ranked for the last three years as the top university less than 50 years old in all of North America. Absolutely. And it's our, it's, our, it's our students who are our best ambassadors, and of course, uh, Jen as one of our, uh, as one of our graduates. Um, we have the largest fine arts faculty uh, in, the, in the country, and you'll be hearing uh, from Kelly Javits in a few moments, who's a member of that faculty. Um, I think we're really known for the work we're doing uh, in areas like cybersecurity and applied AI, and you're going to hear from Tristan Glatar on, on that in a moment. But I'd also like to believe that Concordia is a university that's known for its strong commitment to social justice, whether that's the work that we're doing in indigenous directions or anti-black racism or, or tackling racism uh, and prejudice of other, of other kinds. That's all, also always been a hallmark of Concordia and may that, may that commitment long continue. So I'll stop there and just say again how thrilled I am uh, and grateful to all of you for coming out and just re-emphasize once more how proud I am to be a part of this uh, partnership with, uh, with the Walrus Magazine and uh, in collaboration with our great grad, Jen Hollett, and I'll turn it back to her now, and please enjoy the evening. Jen, over to you. There we go, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Graham, and absolutely, as a student at Concordia, I remember having late night conversations in residence about social justice issues, and so many were new to me, but it was meeting students from across Canada and around the world and hearing those firsthand experiences and opinions of getting in the debates and all the clubs and profs and departments that really fostered that, that learning. The conversation around what comes next, I think is the conversation we're having every minute of the day what next? What now? What do we take away from this really challenging time that I want to say we've been through, but the reality is we're still in. And there's an opportunity in this pandemic to think about how things could be better and how we get there and what that means for Canada. Tonight, we'll be hearing from six people, academics, journalists, advocates and big thinkers. And we're, we'll get their thoughts on what's next, what's ahead. Here's how the Walrus Talks works. Each talker has seven minutes. The talks go back to back to back, back to back to back. And once your head is full of new ideas, we'll have lots to talk about at the post-talks reception to which you're all invited. Tonight, we'll be hearing from a stellar lineup author and health columnist at the Globe and Mail, Andre Picard. Artist and associate professor of sculpture at Concordia University, Kelly Jasvik. Anti-rape activist, Tufa Jallo. Mental health and resiliency strategist at LifeWork Wellness, Shannon Gander. Co-director of the Concordia Applied AI Institute and associate professor of computer science at Concordia University, Dr. Tristan Glata and Editor-in-Chief of BuyBlacks.com, Camille Dundas. You'll note on the program that we had writer Sean Witzeller scheduled to speak today, but unfortunately he's not feeling well and he's at home resting, which is the right thing to do. So we hope he gets better soon and we thank him for doing that. All right, it's time to get things started. A big round of applause for our talkers this evening. Hi, my name is Andre Picard, and I'm the health columnist at the Globe and Mail, and I'm the author of the book, Neglected No More, The Urgent Need to Improve the Lives of Canada's Elders. So what? They were going to die anyhow. In March 2020, after I wrote a column about the first pandemic deaths in Canada, which occurred in nursing homes, I received an email from a reader with that dismissive comment. At the time, you could count the pandemic deaths on your fingers. 
but with the novel coronavirus spreading like wildfire, we knew elders were in dire danger. Instead of acting, we started formulating our excuses, like, hey, they were going to die anyhow. Canada has recorded almost 39,000 pandemic deaths to date, and about 21,000 of those have been in congregate settings, like nursing homes. The numbers are sickening enough, but how elders died during the pandemic is even more troubling. In some parts of Canada, we had explicit policies saying nursing home residents should not be sent to hospital. They were left to die. That's just one example of how ageism is baked into our public policies. Most elders during the pandemic died alone, without palliative care, and sometimes without any care at all. Their loved ones were locked out. Some nursing home residents died of starvation and dehydration. This happened in Canada in 2020. This is unconscionable. Yet, these horrors are still dismissed with self-serving bromides like, they were going to die anyhow. Elders living in the community were victims too. About 70% of COVID-19 deaths in Canada have been people over the age of 70. And it's not because of their biology. Let's not fool ourselves. It's because of their life circumstances. More difficult to calculate is the collateral damage of pandemic restrictions and people taking the pandemic for granted. Isolation, loneliness, mental and physical decline, all of these were deadly too, to varying degrees. Well, so what? They were going to die anyhow. The reality is that most of these deaths were preventable. At the very least, we could have prevented a whole lot of suffering. We didn't put an iron ring around the nursing homes to borrow the rhetoric of Ontario Premier Doug, Doug Ford. We didn't even put a paper ring. Heck, staff, residents, families weren't even provided with personal protective equipment, not even a mask. We killed elders with systemic ageist indifference. Now, the way elder care is financed, delivered, and regulated in this country was ineffective, inefficient, fragmented, and unsustainable well before the pandemic. All COVID-19 did was expose the gaping wounds to the world. Yet, we seem to have learned no lessons. We've done very little to repair the broken system at the root of this massacre of neglect. Our response to COVID-19 was a brutal reminder of who matters in society and who doesn't. The pandemic occurred at the intersection of ageism, sexism, and racism. The hardest hit were who? One, elders, most of whom are women. Two, working women, especially those caring for children and or their aging parents. And three, racialized workers, who among other things, do most of the heavy lifting in healthcare. The pandemic drove home the message that old people don't matter. Neither do the people paid and unpaid to care for them. So how do we fix this broken system? How do we move ahead? How do we ensure that a travesty like this never happens again? Well, it begins with a philosophical shift. We need to say in our policies and our practices and in our everyday lives that elders matter dispense with the catastrophizing about aging and the nihilism that dominates. Every problem and every solution is well known. Since the advent of Medicare, there have been 150 reports written recommending reforms. The system is fixable. Doing so is affordable. We just need to start implementing what we know works. Shift some spending from institutional care to home care, uh, invest in supportive housing and other initiatives to keep people in the community, things like Meals on Wheels. Support the army of family caregivers with practical training, respite care, dementia daycare. Now, recent polling has revealed that between 80 and 90% of Canadians say they never want to live in a long-term care facility. Some of them say they'd rather die than be in a nursing home. So why has the principal response to the pandemic been to announce the construction of more nursing homes? That benefits developers, not elders. We have to stop warehousing people when they get a little rickety. Instead of elder apartheid, we need to give elders a choice, a real choice about where they want to live. Now I'm not suggesting we don't need care homes, because we do, especially for people living with advanced dementia and those needing 24 seven care for other reasons but at least half of the 200,000 Canadians in long-term care today probably don't need to be there. They're there for lack of community support. 
When people need care, the homes they live in should be, well, homes. They shouldn't look like prisons, and they shouldn't smell like funeral parlors. And the residents shouldn't be treated like widgets on whom a checklist of tasks must be performed by overburdened care workers. That's today's reality. As sociologist Pat Armstrong famously said, the conditions of work are the conditions of care. The starting point for better care is improving the work environment of personal support workers, social workers, nurses, and others who provide the bulk of elder care. Now, I hope tonight I've convinced you of one thing, that we're going to die anyhow was a cruel lie. That they were going to die anyhow was a cruel lie. But merely keeping people breathing is not enough either. A new improved system has to be built on the bedrock of respect and dignity. Now, I'm a realist. I don't pretend people are going to live forever in perfect health. Yes, we're all going to die. I hate to be the one to break it to you. But elders shouldn't be dying en masse of preventable infections like COVID-19. And they should definitely not be dying of neglect, not in a wealthy country like Canada. Almost all of us are going to live to a ripe old age and die of chronic illnesses like cancer, cardiovascular disease, or COPD. We're going to die in a largely predictable manner. We should live out our final years, months, and days in a home-like environment, surrounded by family, friends, with ready access to the care we want and need. That's not too much to ask. It's actually the bare minimum of what we should expect. So what? They were going to die anyhow. These are words I never want to hear again, especially about our mothers and our grandmothers. Yes, death will come for us all, but it shouldn't be anyhow or any which way. In the future, we should all aspire to a good death at the end of a good life. This requires planning individually and collectively. We need to build a system that supports aging in place and dying with dignity, an elder care system worthy of its name. In the wake of COVID-19, there's a moral and societal imperative to put the care back into elder care. Thank you and good night. My name is Kelly Jazvac and I'm a visual artist. I've been working with recuperated materials, specifically plastic, to make my artworks for the past 15 years. I do so because I'm interested in what a sustainable art practice might look like in the co context of a climate crisis. I see this as a meeting of content and form. This work has led me to collaborate with scientists and cultural workers on plastic pollution research. We call ourselves a synthetic collective. My collaborators have shown me that art and culture can play an important role in making a livable planet for the future. And what I've learned in this work is to continuously reflect on my own positionality. And most importantly, that I need to be ready to be wrong. And I realize that being wrong is not something that you normally brag about on your professional CV, but I do think it's very important for the question of what's next, so hear me out. In 2014, geologist Patricia Corcoran and I, uh, and oceanographer Charles Moore and myself, an artist, co-authored a scientific manuscript. The paper described plastic glomerate, which is what you see here, and what it might mean in the future. Plastic glomerate is our name for a stone made of sedimentary grains and natural debris such as sand, wood, and basalt rock held together by recently molten plastic. It occurs when a beach fire comes into contact with plastic garbage. This happened via campfires on Camilo Beach on the Big Island of Hawaii, but it has also been documented by citizens in many other places around the globe, including the close by Great Lakes a precious source of 21% of the world's fresh water. And you'll see from the image behind me, also linked to plastic. Every red dot represents a plastic industry amongst the Great Lakes. Plastic glomerate has the potential to enter the future geologic rock record, given the added weight and density when the molten plastic binds to beach sediment. Plastic strata for the future, so to speak. Patricia and I traveled to Camilo Beach on a theory of Charles Moore's. His, hypo his hypothesis was that lava from volcanoes was melting plastic debris and creating plastic glomerate. But our local contacts, Noni and Ron Sanford, knew that theory wasn't true. In fact, they knew a lot about what we published as scientific knowledge before we published it. It was people, not volcanoes, making plastic glomerate. 
Most concerning to Noni and Ron was the possible and erroneous public perception that Mother Nature, in the form of lava, was somehow taking care of humans' problems. Noni and Ron, along with the Hawaiian Wildlife Fund, have personally removed tons of plastic from Hawaiian beaches, including mounds of plastic glomerate, long before we arrived there. The suggestion that volcanoes were effectively taking care of this through burning didn't help them in their cleanup effort. They were concerned that the lava theory sends an easy and palatable message to the global consumers and industry. Don't worry about this at the source of the problem, because it is being taken care of at the other end. This mindset doesn't ask anyone to rethink their own responsibility in this, nor how they relate to the entire planet. Camilo is a beach that receives a remarkable amount of plastic pollution due to its proximity to the North Pacific gyre and the direction of ocean currents. Hawaii has no petrochemical industry, and it was clear that most of the garbage on the beach was coming from elsewhere. I drew this conclusion non-scientifically, based on the plurality of languages written on the wide range of plastic items found there, whereas Noni, a long-term collector and interpreter of international fishing tags and weather balloons, drew this conclusion from her own personal archive in which Canada was represented. There is also science that backs up this lived observation. Ocean currents, like capitalism, colonialism, and consumerism, are globalized. Decisions made here, where I stand now, have a far reach. The plastic glomerate research that resulted from that study has gone on to be the most often requested, cited, and exhibited aspect of my collaborative research. Even now, almost 10 years later, I get image permission requests uh, on a weekly basis. These ongoing email conversations continue to reveal to me where I was wrong. For example, Patricia and I were very careful not to use the word discover in our scientific paper when we wrote about plastic glomerate. It's not scientifically accurate, and it's a word rife with colonial associations. However, we did use the word new just once, but that was enough. And as a result, we had to radically readjust our image permission guidelines later to avoid promoting entrepreneurial projects by people looking to make profit from this new so-called novel material. So where we saw evidence of harm, someone else saw an opportunity. And thanks to Max Liberon for, and their network for always giving me something to think about on this topic. For me, being ready to be wrong requires an ego check. It requires listening about how oblivious you are and being grateful to hear it, even if that's hard at first. It's understanding that you don't know what you don't know. I find that this is also a beautiful and playful part of meaningful collaboration between people and across disciplines and worldviews. The joy of having to explain your research and ideas to a very smart person who simply has no idea what you're talking about, and vice versa. It's a process that's bursting with humility, laughter, respect, and an honest effort to connect with someone else in the interest of moving something forward. I'm also a teacher, so I'm gonna end with some homework. If you're in a position of power, or if your skin looks like mine, so i.e. fellow white people, and you are ready to be wrong about ideas of sustainability, including your own potentially extractive role in it, I'd like to direct you to a recent conference held at Concordia University called Indigenous Expertise on Sustainability. It was recorded online and is available through Concordia's Fourth Space website. There I learned more ways in which I was wrong, and I'm grateful for it. It's clear that many wrong steps were made to get us to the state of climate crisis and environmental contamination that the planet is now in, and worse, those same mistakes keep getting made. My 19-year-old nephew doesn't feel like he has a future because of climate change. I want to know how to do better for him, and I haven't gotten it right yet. What I do know is that colonial, capitalist, and consumerist mindsets got us here, and their logic, their rules, are not going to get us out of it. But to bring it back to our bodies in this room now and how we might relate to the world, perhaps if each of us here set about learning how we might be wrong in relation to our own power and position, with depth and humility, we will find some valuable answers about what's next. Thank you. Hello. Is the camera on my good side? Yeah. <laughs> my name is Tufa Jalo. I am an auto and an anti-rape activist. Um, first, I will start with a prologue in my book as a way of introducing who I am. It starts, 
It is December 2020. I sit in front of a computer screen with my friend and colleague, Marianne Volkman Brando, watching the rough edit of a short documentary we are producing together. Over the course of 25 minutes, clips of, the compete, of me competing in a 2014 Gambian scholarship pageant are intercut with images of a man who ruled my country for more than two decades, an all-powerful dictator whose dead squad murdered and tortured at his command. Clips of powerful men from other countries appear as well. Harvey Weinstein, who used his position in the film industry to intimidate women into having sex with him. Jeffrey Epstein, who trafficked teenaged girls and young women. Mexican drug lord El Chapo, who declared that young girls were his vitamins because raping them gave him life. But shall I add allegedly? It has been six years since I, declared, I was declared the winner of a national pageant sponsored by my country's president promised a scholarship to study anywhere in the world as my prize. Instead, President Yaya Jame raped me. I became a victim in the Gambia, was a fugitive in Senegal, and then a refugee in Canada. At 19, I started my life over, a survivor of rape, separated from my family, afraid I would never see them again, worried they would suffer if I told anyone what had happened to me. Should I add allegedly? As I rebuilt my life 7,000 kilometers away from the country I'd grown up in, I struggled with depression, with my secret, with loneliness. And then the dictator whose crimes has forced me to flee was deposed and driven out of the Gambia himself. I was able to return to reunite with my family and eventually to tell my story first to human rights investigators, then to international media like the New York Times, the Guardian, the BBC, CBC, and to my, truth, um, uh, to my country's truth reparations commissions. But people kept telling me I should always say, allegedly. And I will skip a part there. In the days and weeks and months after I first spoke out, others in the Gambia spoke out as well, sharing their stories using hashtag I am Tufa as a momentum built in this West African country and in our Me Too movement. I realized the world's interest in me was not because of who I am, but because of who my rapist is, a former president who has rubbed soldiers with the world's most powerful people. Ironically, the status the world has given him gives me more visibility. And so I launched the Tufa Foundation, which I run now, to use that visibility to draw attention to the survivors whose rapists are not presidents, to redirect the power attached to his name to fight for justice for all victims of sexual and gender-based violence. Because my life now stretches across two continents, bridging Africa and not America. The campaigns we are developing draw on the lessons and insights of feminists in both West and in Africa reflecting the strengths of women around the world. In June 2015, Yaya Jambe, then the president of Gambia, raped me. He has never been charged, never been convicted, and because of that, the world thinks I should use the word allegedly. I won't, because he thought he would get away with it, try to erase me. I thought I would never speak of it, that I would remain invisible. And guess what? We were both wrong because I am here, shining like the sunrise of the melanated coast. I am Tufa Jalo, and this is my story. Now, that word, allegedly, I had to investigate myself for a very long time in writing this book and finding myself. Um, I grew up in a small West African country, the Gambia. And growing up in a Muslim dominant home with 20 other siblings and more than four wives, three at a time sometimes, the idea of visibility is almost impossible. And if you're a girl child, it's even harder to be visible. You're taught to be ashamed of your part and your body parts and language around sex and sexuality in general. So when those very parts are violated, you don't know the words for it. And today, although the world is asking what's next, I am at a place where I'm thinking about where we are in the conversation around rape, sexual assault, and just harassment in general, and how we talk about women's bodies and autonomy. And we all know the numbers at this point, the statistics, the one in five, the two in 10, we know them, we've heard them over and over again, and I think we are so over the statistics, and the reality is, what next? When you know all those numbers and all of those statistics, are we going to continue to have conversations around rape and women's bodies and just forever, right? So when we talk about violence and rape, what I realize as a survivor who have walked in this field and walked with so many 
survivors of rape and have stood at graveyards of people that have lost their life because they've been violated, worked with organizations, whether it is in Gambia or in Canada, I realize survivors and allies of survivors are having the conversation from an emotional perspective. And everyone else is having it from a legal perspective. And that's where the word allegedly comes from, when a journalist talks to me. For example, in the Gambia, my president claimed he could cure HIV and AIDS and cancer. And when journalists around the world talk about that, as crazy as it sounds, they do not say the president claimed or the president allegedly cures AIDS. Allegedly almost never shows up in any other concept, concept except for rape and violence. Where is that language coming from? It is coming from the idea that when it comes to women's bodies and rape especially, we cannot just be sure. For some reason, it is the most nuanced and most misunderstood issue that happens to people's bodies, right? So what next for me in conversation around the Me Too movement is that, you know, Tarana Burke four years ago said something. She said, the Me Too movement can either be a conversation starter or it can be the conversation itself. And unfortunately, where we are right now is that the Me Too movement has only been and has become a conversation starter and not the conversation itself. We start the conversation, we go midway, we go back and forth and we let it be. There are academics who have academic research to do on this issue. There are journalists who want to be right about it. But I want to represent, when I find myself in these rooms, I want to represent those victims and survivors who sometimes do not have the language for rape. Where I come from, when you say someone rapes you and you directly interpret it into English, it means someone fell on me, someone rubbed their thighs on my thighs. They do not have language for the violence that has been done to their bodies. So it's a privilege to have language for it. And when the entire conversation around sexual assault is immersed in language and English and colonial concepts, we are forgetting the people that do not have the language for it. People who are trying to understand how to take themselves away from cultural concepts that hold them tied. But it's interesting that whether you're coming from West Africa, in my experience in Canada, there's this international concept of not believing women, of legalizing conversations around women and the violations that have been done to their bodies. So today, I hope and that I am asking you to step out of that first question you ask yourself, to question why is it that when you hear a woman has been violated, your first notion is to disbelieve rather than to believe and then figure out maybe not believing is always to not believe and then walk your way to believe in. How do we come to a place where we humanize stories and experiences of sexual violence survivors? And that will mean that we will have to decolonize the concept of rape and violence on bodies, where sex and sexuality and broadening our concept of who is a woman or not a woman comes in as well. What is next is to move away from conversations and start to really put ourselves in the shoes of this woman, is to say, although, yes, you know, it is this excuse of, oh, sometimes, you know, women lie about violence. Yes, but isn't it funny as a society that when it comes to any other topic, we lean towards the majority, whether it's our elections or any other decisions we make, it's only when it comes to violence that has been done to people that we lean towards to say, hey, let's also look at the minority group here which is great, but why is it only selective and, and specific to that? Um, I believe that the refugee and immigrant survivor story is also part of the Canadian conversation. A lot of us will watch TV series and often our experiences probably is to see that person that has been trafficked sexually on our special, uh, special victim unit episode. Or that one person that we know, or the movies that we watch of people that are fleeing violence and they've been gang raped during war. How many of us have actually interacted with people that are survivors of these things, interacting, living with us here in Canada? And somehow we can have a middle ground where we can bridge the divide and we can have a conversation that is diverse and we can decentralize our conception notions of violence. So the statistics aside, the science aside, and the academics aside, can we please move on to the next phase 
where we humanize survival stories and then accept their realities for what they are. Thank you. Hello, I'm Shannon Gander. I'm a mental health and resiliency strategist from LifeWork Wellness. I want you to think of this basket as your container. We all have a container. And I want you to think of these apples as representing your resources or energy. And from the time we get up in the morning till the time we go to bed at night, we're burning up our resources, right? So maybe you get up in the morning and you have a dog to feed. And then maybe you have lunches to make and maybe you have kids to get ready, and then you have to get yourself ready, and then you get to work, and that might be only four to 15 steps from our kitchen these days, right? Then you start returning email, and then you go to meetings. You see what's happening here, right? Show of hands, anybody else? You're amongst friends here, so I'll lift my hand really high. Anybody else feel like they're failing at work-life balance? Yeah, but here's the thing. Burnout is cultural. It's not uncommon for us to end the day completely depleted of our resources, right? You might even feel these days like there's a hole in the bottom of your basket because you've entirely overextended yourself. And how that shows up is not being able to enjoy our yeses because we haven't said no to anything. Or more commonly, you've left your best energy at work and then your family gets your leftovers. Or maybe that's just me, right? So what has this long pandemic journey done to our mental well-being? We could talk about anxiety. We could talk about depression. Absolutely, we could talk about loneliness. But let's talk about burnout. 35% of Canadians report being burnt out. The statistics are higher for women, and they're double in some industries. And we know that burnout doesn't belong to the pandemic. Like, it came long before the coronavirus. But what this time has done is shine a light on this issue, because never before have our work and home lives been so closely blended. Is it just me, or has anybody else witnessed themselves walking around with their laptop to so many different areas in their home that there's nowhere sacred where you don't think about work? Oh, here's where I sit and think about work, and there's where I sit and think about work. And when I watch Netflix, I definitely sit and think about work. It makes me think of student days, you know, when you snacked while you studied. Then every time you opened your, your books to study, you're like, oh, I feel like something a little sweet. I feel like something a little salty, because those stimulus go so closely together. Let's look at how we've scheduled meetings during this time in remote work, right? If you were in the office, you would attend a meeting, the meeting would end, you may drop your water, so to speak, uh, maybe fill your water, go on to the next meeting, or maybe back to your desk. In remote work, look what we've done, scheduled meetings back to back to back. In, in fact, often the meetings run overtime, right? As, as if we don't have any basic needs when we're working from home to take care of. Yeah, people have stopped taking breaks. They're eating over their laptops. Early pandemic days, people said, oh, I ate all my COVID snacks in the first three weeks. But fast forward, clients are saying to me, oh, I binged last night. And then I was looking back and realized, I haven't eaten lunch all week, right? Does this sound familiar to anyone? You could put your hand up. Yeah, so what do we know? We know that People want flexible futures. They want to choose where they work. They want hybrid options. So for many organizations, the home office is here to stay. But that's not a bad thing. We just need to look at doing it differently. We need to look at doing it more sustainably. We also know that self-care is not a self-management issue alone. It is as systemic as it is cultural. And so what's next? If we're gonna go forward and thrive into the future in this office and how that looks, well, more organizations need to look at psychological health and safety in the workplace. There's information that exists with factors, and these factors are all researched, 
on how to support employee mental health, how to protect it. So it's beyond workplace health and safety just being the tripping hazards and the, you know, something not falling in our, on our heads. It's about how we protect our mental well-being. And that information is accessible to us if we're willing to use it. If we need to even heed the, the warning that if you want to recruit top talent and retain it, it's not uncommon for a millennial to ask, so what's your policy on balance in this workplace? And how do you support employee mental health, right? What's next? We need to look at 25 minute meetings instead of 30 minute meetings, 50 versus 60, and in some case, less meetings, right? We also need to look at fostering cultures where employees don't feel like they have to have the green dot on their profile going all day long to indicate that they're working. Right? So that means looking at the factors of both balance and work-life management, because if we just look, we can talk to employees about work balance. You can even have a great policy around that. But if the workload is mile high and knee deep, then score one for burnout, score zero for balance. And so as we continue going forward, we also need to challenge messages that burnout is a rite of passage to a leadership position. Right? So that so that future leaders aren't walking billboards for burnout. And so that they can actually exhibit some skills around their own mental well-being so that other people can do the same. Which brings me back to this basket, your container. We don't need PhDs in balance. No, but we need to really get curious about work-life boundaries. So I really want people to learn to save some apples. When we do that, so when I engage in my own self-care, everybody's better for that, believe me, my family is better off for that too. But also when we do that, we need to recognize that if we do that, it actually gives permission to other people to do the same. So maybe we need to get curious about our own re remote work habits, right? So this might be the best year for an accountability buddy. And having done years of couple therapy, I'm just gonna suggest maybe don't make that your partner. Have it be like a, a friend or a coworker. And on those days when maybe you have that four to 15 step commute from your kitchen to your office, and it's not a 30 to 45 minute drive or subway, instead of just jumping on your laptop and starting work earlier, consider using that commute time to take care of your own well being. That's like compound interest to our mental health bank. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Tristan Glattar. I'm a professor and researcher in computer science. And tonight, I would like to talk to you about uncertainty in artificial intelligence, or AI. My work is about using big data for health science. It's about modeling the massive amounts of data which are currently available in health. In order for us to predict the progression of the most complex diseases, such as Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, and perhaps one day develop new treatments for these diseases. Modeling data is the basis of AI. AI may help us predict these diseases, may help us predict the outcome of potential treatments, may help us anticipate their progression it is a really exciting technology for neurologists, radiologists, physicians, oncologists, and for millions of people in Canada and worldwide. Since I started using data in my research, I realized that data manipulations tremendously impact the way that AI models are built. Computers are extremely flexible. There are, in fact, thousands of different possibilities to process the same data set using a computer. Maybe you want to use different ha hardware systems. Maybe one could use different software pieces. 
or maybe one could assemble software pieces differently. Maybe one could use different parameterizations of these software pieces. And it gets worse because software pieces also depend on other software pieces, which in turn depend on other software pieces. And on it goes. Data manipulations, data processing, is a very complex ecosystem. The thing is that even tiny variations in this ecosystem may have an important impact on decisions taken by data models and eventually on the lives of people impacted. This abundance of processing options is a notion to explore and this creates problems as well as opportunities. The problems this abundance of processing options make AI uncertain. Different models may disagree with each other because they were built using different processing options or different computer configurations. For instance, some models may predict that a given patient will develop a disease, while other models may predict that the same patient won't develop the disease. So how are we going to decide which model to trust? Which one is right and each, which one should be ignored? This is a very serious issue for AI and for health applications. Uncertainty isn't a surprise though. Humans are also, also disagree very often, but in AI it's a bit different because the validity of an AI system directly stems from the data from which it was built. Data models may become completely nonsensical when they are applied out of their validity bounds, when they are applied on data that they have never seen before. For instance, if a data model was trained on a data set that includes a substantial amount of gender stereotypes, this AI model may become sexist. Likewise, if an AI model was built using a very specific computer configuration and very peculiar data manipulations, then this model will, model will be biased toward this particular configuration. Change a parameter in this complex ecosystem and the uncertainty of an AI model may go completely uncontrolled. The opportunity we can make AI better by understanding this uncertainty. Healthcare providers also sometimes disagree about a particular patient. Some may think that this treatment may, should be used, others may think that another treatment should be used. But it's not necessarily a deal breaker because as humans, we have invented ways to build consensus, to confront arguments, and to make the consensus better than any individual opinion. There is no reason that AI models cannot go towards such an informed uncertainty. Current AI models only see a drop in the ocean of analytical um, possibilities and uh, data options. We need to widen their focus. But how to combine these voices meaningfully? Is there even value in these apparent contradictions or is it just noise? Answering these questions may produce safer and more reliable AI models. In conclusion, AI is taking a critical place in our lives. As with many other technologies before, it will continue to help us take our most complex decisions and support our lives. However, AI models are not perfect. They come with uncertainty, which is ingrained in data and in data manipulations. For this technology to remain at our service, it requires a critical eye from us collectively. We need to look at the data because the capacity of AI models to predict the future is entirely based on our capacity to acquire relevant and representative data about the past. We need to look into the glass boxes of data models because nothing is magic out there. We need to understand how they work 
under which assumptions, when they can be used, and when they can't be used. And most importantly, humans must remain in the loop to monitor and evaluate AI models constantly. With great power comes great responsibility. AI may have the power to cure the most terrible diseases of our times, but the responsibility for getting there will remain on us. Good evening. My name is Camille Dundas. I'm the editor-in-chief of buyblacks.com. It must have been during the year 2009. I was working the night shift at a very popular 24-hour news station in Toronto. It's a lonely shift. I liked it. But when the phone rang at minutes to 11, there was no one around to answer but me. I picked up the phone, and the voice on the other end asked me a very direct question. Are you going to do a story on how my brother is innocent? At first, I was confused, and I stuttered. Um, I, he said, a few months ago, you did a story on my brother. You put up his mugshot over and over and over, but he was acquitted. He's not guilty. So I am asking, are you going to do a story about that? I wanted to say yes, but I knew the answer was no. We weren't going to do a follow-up story because that's just not the way it's done. We throw dozens of mugshots up on screen every day, day after day, of many young black men who are accused, not necessarily convicted, of a crime. We don't care if they're innocent or guilty because we just need something to fill those 24 hours of news. But I couldn't tell him that. I didn't know what to tell him, honestly. I apologized and hung up quickly. And for the first time, it occurred to me that we don't treat these stories as if they're about real people as if what we're doing has any real consequence on their lives. And I realized, as journalists, we follow many institutional practices without question. A police press release is published verbatim. The government puts out a study saying most Canadians don't want to defund the police, and media are all over it, word for word. Even when a black man is the victim of a crime, we still use the police-supplied mugshot. And you might be thinking, well, come on, Camille. If he has a mugshot, he was probably a criminal anyway, right? And deserved what he got. Would you like to know when this mugshot was taken? It's from when this young man, Mohamed So, was in middle school. He was getting bullied. The bullies put a T-shirt from Walmart into his backpack to frame him for shoplifting. They thought it would be funny. Security cameras showed he did not steal the shirt, but Mohammed still had to report to police and go to a few days of counseling. That's how his face ended up in the system. And a few years later, that's how his life would be defined. Why is it that we bend over backwards in our headlines to protect the humanity of white offenders? Why is it we never question why police rarely ever release the mugshot of white offenders? Like this one. He committed the country's deadliest mass shooting in history, killing 22 people and then killing himself. At first they said he had no police record, then it was found he assaulted a man in the past and had been charged. But police didn't pull any old mugshots out of their archives. Practicing empathy for people who are not white 
must be a tough learning curve because we in the media seem to be making the same mistake over and over. But don't worry, I am not here to preach about diversifying the newsroom because diversifying the newsroom is not the fix you think it is. Because I'll tell you what it's like to be the diversity in the newsroom. It's being told that your Black History Month pitch is stale because it's February 4th and haven't we done enough? It's being told that you should write your story with Debbie from Newfoundland in mind because that's our audience. It's being told to remove the word racist from your script and replace it with racially charged. It's being told that you're not being objective when you point out that a group of black or indigenous protesters could never bring this city to its feet without being shot or dragged out first. And if you dare call out the white supremacy of it all, the swastikas, the Nazi flags, it's having that story taken away from you because you're engaging in activism. It's watching the selective compassion your white colleagues have as they report on Ukrainian refugees versus Somalian refugees. And being the diversity in the room is to watch all of this happen with absolutely no consequence. With no one in power having the courage to call it what it is, racism. So what's next? Well, for starters, there are some uncomfortable truths we're gonna to have to admit. Legacy news media isn't really a news engine. Legacy news media is a business engine which requires us to do whatever it takes to feed that corporate beast. Second, legacy news media is not objective. It never has been. It's never been fair or neutral, no. It's always been framed with the end goal in mind to preserve the comfort of the privileged, the powerful, and historically, those have usually been white. Headlines tiptoe around colonialism, oppression, racism, because they simply make people in power too uncomfortable. If media were neutral, if media were actually objective, we wouldn't have billionaires like Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk clamoring to buy them all up. They know the power in being able to control a message. But what do we do now? What if we decided that there was a better way? What if we dared to divest from corporate control and invest in the people we claim to care about, the people reading our stories. But how do we do that? There isn't one magic model for this. Yes, it could look like an increase in publicly funded media. I mean, the federal government does spend more on its own public relations office than it does on our public broadcaster. It could look like citizen journalism or participatory journalism, where readers and employees can buy shares and have the same voting rights as bigger shareholders. And it could look like solutions-based journalism, where our work actually supports social change. Now, bringing that type of newsroom to reality takes more than a higher BIPOC initiative. It takes more than bringing us to the table, because let's get honest, that proverbial table is on its last leg. It will take us smashing that table and picking up the pieces and building a whole new table together. As for the future of journalism, we're already there. Independent media, ethnic media, podcasters, TikTok influencers, AI-powered news, breaking news in the metaverse, we're already there. The question is, where are you? Thank you. Wow. 
the energy of these powerful talks. Again, a round of applause. I'd like to thank each of our talkers. Thank you, Andre Picard, for your reporting throughout the pandemic and for tonight's reminder to stand up and care for our elders. Thank you, Kelly Jasvek, for a different look at plastic pollution and for being wrong and admitting it and celebrating it. Thank you to Tufa Jallo for sharing your story, being visible, and reminding us the power of our words. Thank you to Shannon Gander for throwing apples at us, specifically me, <laughs> and giving us a metaphor to keep in mind each day as we try to figure this out. Thank you to Tristan Glata for breaking down AI in a way that didn't scare all of us. <laughs> Shows us what might be possible ahead. And thank you to Camille Dundas for reminding us these are real people, real stories, and real consequences. Thank you again to Concordia University. There's no way we could have this conversation tonight without your support. Now I'm gonna invite our talkers to get up and head to the reception. So if you'd all like to stand up. Now the rest of you have to wait. And while we let them get the first start in making their way out, I'm gonna tell the rest of you a few more things about the walrus. If you enjoyed today's event, we have more coming up. Just make sure to sign up for our newsletter. You can do so at thewalrus.ca, but also at the table at the front reception when you came in. Also at that table, you can subscribe to the walrus. We have a special offer for everyone in the house tonight. You can get eight issues delivered right to your door for just $25. And if you already have a subscription, it's a great gift, and there's Mother's and Father's Day coming up. Also, at the, you're laughing because you're like, I don't have a plan, and this is a good idea, right? Okay. <laughs> we also have Andre Picard and Tufa Jallo's books available at that front desk, and if you purchase them, I checked with both of them, uh, they said they'd be happy to sign those books. In these ongoing, challenging times, it's crucial that trustworthy journalism is available to all. And that's why we depend on our community support to keep the work that we do accessible and independent. The Walrus, we like to say we're a unique beast because we're a registered charity that produces award-winning journalism, events, podcasts, and more. And we do that with the support of our community. So if you had a good time at tonight's event, consider making a donation at thewalrus.ca. All gifts of $20 or more qualify for a tax receipt. Thanks again to Graham Carr, Joanne Pelletier, Philippe Beauregard, and everyone at Concordia University for making tonight's event possible and being an incredible partner to work with. Thank you to our annual sponsors you see listed behind me, Air Canada, Inspire, Labatt Breweries of Canada, Meta, and Shaw. Community is oh so important in these COVID times, and it's something I heard all of the talkers address tonight, and each one of you is part of the walrus. Thanks again to joining us. Thanks again to everyone tuning in online at home, and for those of you who are here, look forward to seeing you at the reception. Until soon. <laughs>